Heat capacity is not the amount of heat that can be stored in an object. Remember, heat is the flow of energy from a high temperature to a low temperature. So what heat capacity actually is, it's the amount of energy required to change an object's temperature by some amount. So, this is the formula for heat capacity, where capital C is heat capacity that equals the change in energy or energy input over change in temperature. Now the units are joules per Kelvin or joules per Celsius. And the reason we could interchange Kelvin and Celsius is because changes in temperature on those two scales are equivalent. So a 5 degree change on a Kelvin scale is also a 5 degree change on a Celsius scale. Suppose we take an object, this seashell, and we want to find the energy input that's required to change this object's temperature by 5 degrees Celsius. The way we'd find that is we'd use this formula. We'd look up the particular C value for this substance, we plug that in, we plug the change in temperature in, and we find the energy input required to uh, affect this object and change this object's temperature by 5 degrees Celsius. Heat capacity is an extensive property, and that simply means if we have some object, the seashell in this hand, and a second object, a uh, seashell twice the size of this one, the amount of energy required to change the largest seashell's temperature by 5 degrees Celsius will be twice as large as this one. And that means if the top Q is twice as large for the same change in temperature, the C will be larger as well. So heat capacity, or C, changes with uh, a change in size of our system. So it's an extensive property. Remember, intensive properties are those properties such as temperature that do not change uh, uh, when there's a change in size. So there are two types of heat capacities that exist. Constant volume heat capacities, or C lowercase v, and constant pressure heat capacities, or C lowercase p. Now, let's talk about constant volume heat capacities. Let's go back to our first law of thermodynamics, which basically states the total change of energy of our system is equal to the change in internal energy of our system plus PV work done. So if this circle is our system and all these molecules are found within our circle, the change in energy is equal to the change in all the potential energies and kinetic energies found within our system and the PV work done, or the work done by these molecules on the surrounding molecules in expanding or compressing uh, this system here. So, when there's a constant volume, let's look at our equation. This guy goes to zero, because at constant volume, what happens to our change in pressure? Well, it's zero. So change in energy is simply change in internal energy. So if there is a transfer of energy into a system, all the energy is transferred into increasing internal energy of our system. And because internal energy is related to kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is related to temperature, increasing internal energy increases kinetic energy, and that increases temperature. So all the energy in, uh, at constant volume goes into increasing temperature. No PV work is done. No expansion is done. At constant pressure, however, according to the ideal gas law, temperature must change as well, and volume must change. So that means that some energy goes into increasing temperature, and some energy goes into increasing volume. Okay, So this term is no longer zero. This term exists, and PV work is done. And that's why CP values, or the heat capacity at constant pressure values, are usually larger than constant volume heat capacity values. And that's because if we go back to this term here, and we look at this equation, for constant volume, this last part was zero. So for this guy, we'd simply plug in change in U. For the second equation, however, we have this last term. So this Q here, this entire section here, would be greater. So some number over a change in temperature versus a smaller number over the same change in temperature will give us a smaller C value. So this guy will be smaller than this guy. 
So recall that heat capacity is an extensive property, so it will increase with increase in size of the system. Now specific heat capacity and molar heat capacities were developed as intensive properties. And that means that these two guys will stay the same when the size will increase. So, let's define specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to change a specific amount of mass of an object by some temperature. The formula is lowercase c is equal to input and energy Q over change in temperature times mass. Now we have this mass component in our denominator. And the units are joules per kilogram times Kelvin or calorie per gram times Celsius. Now, it's an intensive property. Why? Well, because Q is an extensive property and M is an extensive property. And from our lecture on extensive and intensive properties, we saw that when we divide an extensive property by another extensive property, we get an intensive property. And that's because if you increase the size of the object, Q increases and M increases. But M increases by a similar amount. And so the QM ratio stays the same. So C stays the same or a specific heat capacity stays the same. So let's define molar heat capacity. Molar heat capacity is the amount of energy required to change some known amount of moles of an object by some temperature. And the formula is almost the same thing as this one, except the mass is replaced with number of moles, and kilogram and gram is replaced by moles. Now once again, this guy is also an intensive property because we divide extensive property by another extensive property. This QM ratio stays the same. And so C, our molar heat capacity, also stays the same.